My name is Bjarke Ingels. Uh, I'm an architect from uh, Denmark. Uh, I have offices in Copenhagen and New York. Uh, and uh, uh, two and a half years ago, uh, we won a competition to design uh, a mosque and a uh, museum for religious harmony here in, uh, in Tirana. Uh, and, and sort of ever since then, uh, I've been having sort of a keen interest on, uh, uh, on the developments that have been going on here. Uh, the, the project that, that, that we've been uh, sort of involved in could really deserve to be realized because Albania could become a quite viable and trustworthy global platform for the dialogue between uh, all the different faiths. I think when, when you come to uh, Tirana uh, and Albania for the first time, uh, you actually see, like, for instance, like, Tirana as a capital city organized around this... Uh, this axis that has been informed by a sort of Italian rationalism and uh, you know sort of a more sort of communist socialist uh, more expressive uh, uh, architecture you have like all of these different influences that are all relatively recent it means that you have a, a sort of a, an urban fabric that even though a lot of the buildings are not very old there's uh, there's a certain saturation that in a way you can say Albania has gone through uh, like m more sort of a, a political a cultural turmoil in the last hundred years than, than uh, you know, Denmark is the oldest kingdom in the world. It has gone on for like more than a thousand years. Uh, so we've had like more stability in a way in the last thousand years than Albania has in the last hundred. So, so I think some finding ways of, of, uh, of incorporating this recent history into uh, uh, a projection uh, into the future. Uh, I mean, ov obviously there's a, a whole issue about uh, economic development. Um, and I think, you know, every time you see problems, they are also potentials. So I think, uh, I think one of the great potentials uh, is that there is this quite successful illegal settlements. That when you drive around, the illegal settlements almost uh, look uh, as nice or sometimes even nicer than, uh, than the, the, the actual uh, sort of uh, legal city. Uh, and I think rather than seeing the illegal settlements as problems, to see them as a potential proactive urban model where people have done things the way they would like them to be. Also, they have a very rich life of like little shops, cafes, restaurants. Uh, and I think in a way, rather than trying to normalize it, to try to embrace it and accommodate it, and by legalizing it, uh, you also give, of course, a lot of value to the people that have created these communities and you can use that value to maybe help uh, sort of insert some of the sort of social uh, infrastructure, the educational infrastructure that, uh, that could make these places real cities. But where you see sometimes real planning fails to create lively cities because they're like sort of a deadpan uh, sort of repetitions of uh, monoprogrammatic housing blocks, whereas these illegal settlements actually have a richness and a variation that is truly urban and, and could be built upon. When you, want, when you walk around, Albania seems to be full of underutilized potential. Uh, almost like half the buildings have an extra floor that's uninhabited. So I think, first of all, I would just pick all of the low-hanging fruits, because like all of the potential is just sitting there uh, and, and waiting to, uh, to come to fruition. I think the pyramid that you have here in, uh, uh, in Tirana, which is built as a sort of retrospective mausoleum separating uh, uh, a sort of a, a, a sort of communist leader could actually be reinvented uh, and has already been reinvented by the people because like nobody is better and no at knowing what kind of a city they want than the citizens themselves and uh, you know you see people uh, sitting on the pyramid uh, uh, I've seen pictures of the pyramid full of people during uh, political rallies you see children sliding on it that a national monument, instead of being a mausoleum of the past, can actually be a projection of the values uh, and the life that you want uh, your city and your, uh, and your country to uh, embody. So imagine a national monument that is almost like a playground for the people, uh, where public space and public monument becomes a, a single entity. That pyramid could really become a, a project that in a very tangible and practical, uh, physical way, could uh, sort of capture some of the youthful and innovative spirit that could characterize Albania in the future. One of the, one of the things that we've experienced in Copenhagen 
is that investments into sustainability uh, might come from a economical or an environmental or moral um, initiative but if they're done in the right way they can actually lead to increases in life uh, lifestyle and quality of life so for instance um, uh, my first project uh, in architecture was that we uh, we built the Copenhagen Harbor bath that extends public life in the middle of the city into the port because our harbor water has become so clean that you can swim in it you don't have to go for hours to go to the beach you can actually jump in the port in the middle of the city so by having a city that is so clean that the water becomes actually a, a social space and not just some kind of a cesspool for, for industry and, uh, and shipping, uh, has really made a tremendous change in the quality of life in Copenhagen. And I think another example where uh, Copenhagen has over the last 10 or 20 years invested uh, consistently in bicycle lanes, in making dedicated uh, traffic lights for bicycles, in making bicycle super highways. That means that people even from greater distances can come into town. So now, uh, over the last de uh, two decades, the, the amount of uh, pe people traveling or commuting by bicycle has been increasing steadily. Also, we got one of the first uh, bicycle uh, systems in the world where you could get free bicycles when you go to Copenhagen uh, and just drive them around uh, and put them where you, you took them. Um, so today, 40% of all Copenhageners commute by bicycle. And I spoke with, uh, uh, with one of the econ economists who was here for the uh, econ economical summit. And he said he was here for the first time in, in 1989. And back then there was no cars. There was buses uh, and maybe some uh, party members uh, and then uh, bicycles. So I think in a way it could be interesting for Tirana since it is, although the climate is hot, it's also uh, flat. Uh, so Tirana could maybe apart from harvesting some of the, uh, the natural resources, maybe sort of look back to evolving uh, the bicycle once again uh, and, and trying to see if through the physical planning, Tirana could once again become sort of a, a bicycle capital which could, could be rather radical in a, in, in a southern city, uh, which is made possible by the, by the culture and uh, the heritage and also by uh, the topography being so flat. I think the, the important takeaway is to uh, not uh, sort of tear down all of the of the monuments of past regimes that you might not disagree uh, that you might disagree with uh, uh, in the current perspective, and to not sort of forget about the the cultural heritage, heritage uh, that's like in the the culture and the religion of uh, of the citizens of uh, Albania, but to somehow try to. Uh, interpret, reinterpret, rejuvenate, uh, and reappropriate uh, some of the symbols and some of the heritage uh, that you have and try to turn it into the, the stepping ground for, for the, uh, you know, the values of the Albania you want to create and, uh, um, and, and maybe the, uh, the quality of life of the Albania that you want to live in.